I've really come away with this kind of rally cry of one, taking ownership of our thoughts, actions, behaviors, and not passing the blame on anyone else, taking full responsibility. And golf teaches you that 100%, right? There's no one to blame. There's no referees. There's no teammates. There's nothing. You have to take full ownership. And how much better would this world be if we were all better at doing that? Uh, and the second part of that rally cry is never settling for less than you're capable of. And that's our default. We all default to settling. So we have to have effort and intention to not settle for less than we're capable of. And that's a daily thing. Taking ownership entails self-awareness. We have to be aware of what we are not taking ownership for or what we need to take ownership for. And I think self-awareness is something that we all can grow in. And then the second one, never settling, the only way we never settle is by having discipline and developing discipline in our lives. Golf Smarter number 760. Increasing self-awareness to decrease your scores with former tour player and author Thane Marcus Ringler. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Thane. Thanks so much for having me, Fred. Excited to uh, share some words with you today. Well, that's good because you're a persistent guy. You, <laughs> I have to say, I, you know, I, I make suggestions to people, hey, write to me if you have somebody you want me to talk to. Well, you've listened to the show before and you wrote to me two years ago. I think you were still in elementary school at the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but but you, um, you wrote to me two years ago and you've continued to write to me and I've felt like, why am I keep blowing this guy off? I shouldn't do this. Okay, let's do it, Fane. We're here. Come on. <laughs> we're here. From here to there. That's the name of the book, and that's the name of what we've gone through from here to there. So welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast. You know, it's even sweeter two years later, right? <laughs> well, hopefully you've gained more life experience. Mm -hmm. You have more to discuss, and we will go over that. So um, interesting book, From Here to There, A Quarter Life Perspective on the Path to Mastery. Mm. What are we mastering? Well... Personal development, personal mastery is a lot of what that book is about. And it's your best, the best that you can bring into the world based on how you've been created, equipped and um, designed to do. And, um, you know, a lot of it, the, the, the interesting story about the book was I had been playing professionally for about um, three and a half years when the book kind of professional golf, professional golf. Yep. So I played golf okay. since I was three or four years old. I uh, loved the sport. Grew up in Kansas, about a mile away from Prairie Dunes Country Club, which is just uh, one of the best courses in the world. I'm a little biased, but it is in the top, I think, 40 or 50 in the world. Um, so that was a real gem and a real treat. And, you know, the, the sport just taught me so much as a kid growing up. Uh, and then it continued in college and beyond professionally to teach me so much about myself and about life. And as I came out of professional golf, um, I had an injury for the last, the last a year and a half of my career, a muscle strain in my back that repeated five times over that year and a half. And it was just oh. a really frustrating cycle. Uh, and in the midst of that, I was flying over, I believe it was to Thailand for the Asian Tour Qualifier. And I had re-aggravated the, the injury the week before. And I, in my, in my heart, I knew I wouldn't be able to compete, but I had to try because I wouldn't get my money back anyways. So I was flying over there and I was thinking, you know, if, if I can't return, I, I had a group of investors that invested in, in my career. And, and I was thinking if I couldn't pay, repay them back financially for what they've given me, what could I give them as a thank you uh, for this journey? Mm -hmm. And that was where the initial idea of the book came from. What if I wrote a book about this experience and what golf has taught me um, and gave that to them as a way to say thanks. Uh, so that was the original idea for the book. And then when I started writing it um, during uh, the injury time later that, that year in 2017, um, it really turned into more of a book about how to pursue excellence in life in any field based on the experiences of playing golf my whole life and pursuing excellence in one, one sport. Uh, and a lot of that stemmed from Jocko Willink's book, uh, Extreme Ownership, where he does the same thing, illustrating what it, what it means to be a leader and lead with extreme ownership illustrating it from his time as a Navy SEAL leading uh, and commanding SEAL teams, which is pretty powerful. Yeah, pretty powerful. 
anything with Navy SEAL is like, ooh. It's wild. But, so how much success did you have? I mean, you talk about excellence. Did you achieve excellence? Did you, I mean, how, how, what's your perspective on excellence from your personal experience? Yeah, so I didn't achieve what I set out to, right? As uh, Playing professionally, you set out to make it to the BJ Tour. That's the goal, always. <laughs> and I didn't achieve that. I didn't make it. Um, I didn't have much success in getting on the corn Ferry tour either. Uh, I, I did get to over to the one Asia tour for a season competed over there. So I got to play against some of the, you know, Adam Scott, uh, Jordan Spieth, Lee Westwood, some of those guys over in the Australian open and in Fiji and some cool places, but I never capitalized on those opportunities. Uh, and my story was really one of untapped potential. I have a lot of natural talent and ability, but I always held myself back. I always got in my way and, and mentally I was a little bit too weak. Um, and so a lot of uh, my experiences and what I've learned is from failing. Uh, and that's a lot of what I, I like to share with people too, is that we always learn what not to do before we learn what to do, right? And well, how, how do you ever learn anything without failure? I mean, because if, you're, if something goes well, you're just going to try to repeat it. Not really sure what you did, but it's like, oh, I'm going to just keep doing that because it worked. One hundred percent. The only yeah, experience means failure because you're learning from what you did wrong. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. You know, and and what's been really cool is I never would have planned on doing anything that I'm doing now. Um, and those doors kind of opened up because I failed in golf because I didn't reach or accomplish what I set out to. It it led me to what was next, and a big part of what I try to share with others and, and preach to myself and remind myself of is that um, failure isn't fatal and failure isn't final. Uh, and so when you think about a failure, we, we think about it as a scary thing because a lot of times we attach our identity to what we do instead of who we are. And when I did that with golf, right? I was a professional golfer. That was my identity. And so it's so scary to reach the end of my career and be like, my identity is a failure because I've been placing my identity in this thing called professional golf is what I do, but that's not who I am. And so by understanding, you know, we all do this, we all place our identity in what we do. And so if we can separate our identity from what we do, then we realize that a failure is just, again, telling us what not to do so we can learn what to do. And it's leading us to get better and opening the door for what's next. A lot of times we think about if I, it's this dead end mentality that if you go down this road and you fail, it's a dead end. You have to go all the way back to the start again. But a failure is not a dead end. You, if it is, you you reach the dead end, you take a few steps back, you pick a new trajectory, you pivot and go in a new direction with all the experience you've gained up to that point. Um, and that's a lot less scary and allows us to pursue things that are challenging. And honestly, I can't think of anything more challenging than being successful as a professional golfer. Mm. Um, you, you said you grew up, you started playing golf when you were like three. What was the success and failure of golf a regular part of your uh, dinner table conversation with your family? You know, they did a really good job of um, not making the our world revolve around what we did, um, sports or competed in or, or even schoolwork. They did a good job of keeping us grounded um, and pretty holistic in that. Um, and I'm grateful for that a lot because I think a lot of times I'm guessing I'm not a parent yet, but I'm guessing the tendency for myself as a parent in the future will be to, um, focus too much on the sports or the achievements or accomplishments. And they always did a good job of framing it in effort. You know, as long as you gave your best effort, that's what we care about. Um, and, and I think that was really healthy. And as I had a lot of natural talent, so I did have a lot of success as a junior golfer in Kansas um, and did really well and had um, me and a couple other a couple guys that actually just got their cards this last year. Michael Gellerman and Harry Higgs were some of the guys I, I grew up competing against. And, and the three of us, we had a lot of good matches and um, it's super fun watching them now. Uh, but they did. I, I'm really grateful for my parents and the way that they allowed me to pursue the sport, but not made that my entire world. Um, do you have siblings? I mean, is you have a, how large is your family? Yeah. So I've I'm really going to pursue this dinner table conversation thing. I like it. So my sister is two years older, Court, Courtney. She played okay. tennis growing up, uh, played okay, tennis in college tennis as well. She was pretty good. Did she um, play golf growing up too? 
She, she, would, competed, she competed in tennis. Yes, she, she didn't, didn't really play, play golf. golf. No, she played okay. softball, basketball. She did a lot of sports, but tennis was was definitely the one for her. My dad, he played basketball and tennis in a smaller college in Kansas. Um, so he had a lot of talent. And then he got into golf as well. And and now he's actually a better tennis player than golfer, although he still is a really good golfer. He's probably a seven or eight handicap. So uh, it was always really fun. You know, that's probably why I really... Uh, was drawn to golf is just going out with my dad and having a blast with him. And it's just us, you know, there's something so special about that. Um, and I still have the fondest childhood memories of just being out on the course, you know, near sunset, walking the back nine with my dad. I mean, those are, those are the best times. Hey, you're going to make me cry. Well, let's take a time out. I'll be right back. <laughs> what a beautiful story. <laughs> What a week in sports, right? Football is back. The NBA Finals start tonight. And here's a crazy piece of trivia that my son pointed out. LeBron James has now been to the Finals more than all NBA teams except the Lakers, Celtics, and Warriors. And also today is the start of the baseball playoffs. So this week on Radio Baseball Cards, the podcast, we get to hear a crazy story from Chet Lemon. Here's your host, the late Hall of Famer, Don Drysdale. Here's another radio baseball card. During the Tigers' 84 championship season, Chet Lemon learned that there is no such thing as a routine fly ball. Uh, it was a fly ball hit the center field, and the ball got in the sun. And I flipped my glasses down, and I flipped them up, and uh, lo and behold, I was right under the baseball. That's the Radio Baseball Cards podcast. Short stories as told by the greatest baseball players of the 20th century. Radio Baseball Cards is free and available wherever you subscribe to your favorite podcasts. Fane, when you were growing up, and you had you had you were saying just one sister, mm -hmm. that, or did we did I stop you short on that? Nope, okay, just so one. One sister is a family of four. Did your mom play golf? She didn't. You know, she Which um did? she would she she loved watching and coming out and and being a fan, uh, but she yeah, she wouldn't play that much. Yeah, so it was really mm -hmm. just me and my dad. Really? Okay. So uh, it, so was the conversation just continued uh, at home? Uh, about the rounds, about what you're doing, about your your approach to the game and your mental aspect and your discipline. Were those things that, that you had long conversations with your dad always? And that's you, why it's just part of your mentality now? You know, it never was like uh, the biggest mm -hmm. focus. Uh, you know, my family is a, a, a Christian family. And so faith was always the biggest focus for us and um, still is to this day. And so I'd say most of the foundation revolved around faith. And then um, the things that we were doing were a big part of it. You know, my dad always had almost bigger dreams than I did. He, he always would ask me, you know, one day thing you could play on the tour. That could be you, you know? And, um, and I would, I was kind of the, I guess partly because I was overly or hyper competitive and I hated losing so much that I didn't want to set my expectations or hopes too high and be let down. So I was like, yeah, dad, there's a lot of steps before that. I don't know. It'd be cool, but you know, let's just cool our jets right now. <laughs> so he was actually more of a believer in myself than I was at times because I didn't want to be let down by not achieving or accomplishing that, um, which is pretty interesting to see how that kind of flip flopped. Yeah, that's very interesting. And were you um, uh, hyper competitive, uh, hated losing? Mm -hmm. And did you have uh, temper issues? Did you lose your cool uh, when you're out on the course or, or, and your dad kept you in line or he let you out go nuts? You know, you know? I never had um, outward anger issues. I got angry at myself. And so I um, let that out on myself through working harder and punishing myself through more discipline ultimately um, because I knew that those other outward expressions wouldn't do anything to help me and actually would probably hurt me more. But on the flip side, when I get angry at myself, that also hurts you. And I didn't realize that as a kid. Now I'm much more aware of there's a great book uh, Timothy Galway wrote called The Inner Game of Tennis. Tennis. Yep. It's phenomenal, right? And the two selves mm -hmm. and how they communicate to each other within ourself is oftentimes a really important metric for success. And for me, 
the dialogue within myself was often uh, too harsh and too critical and too angry at myself that also led to poor performance. But as a kid, I, I wasn't outwardly angry. I just hated losing so much. I wouldn't do things if I wasn't going to win. I mean, I would practice. I remember in grade school, I practiced, I went home and practiced shuffling cards for a week because I want to be the best card shuffler because we started getting into cards at school in recess. And so I just went and practiced so I could be the best. Um, I would practice video games so that when I had my friends over, I could beat them. You know, those kind of things. Like, it's just, I, I, I even stopped playing basketball as much because I just hated losing. And in basketball, part of the reason why I was drawn to golf is that in golf, you control all the variables. Uh, and so you don't have to depend on other teammates or referees. And it's all in your hands, which as a kid, you know, you're ignorant and you think, yes, I can fully control and, and make sure I, I win or do the best. But you start realizing that there's a flip side of that, that you have to take full ownership of all the results, including the negative ones. And there's often way more negative than positive, especially in a sport like golf. Yep. Especially in a sport like golf. And so you liked to practice. I mean, you seem like, you know, you find something that you want to get good at and you just dig your feet in and bury your head right into it. So you're practicing a lot. Yeah. Right? Do you like that process of practicing? I do. I like the process, the discipline of it. it there's something beautiful about this um, necessary suffering, I guess is the way to say it. Even though Ouch. practice isn't like a necessary <laughs> suffering, it is this discipline, this rigor that it takes to fine tune your body and the movements that are needed and the touch that's needed to execute to the best of your ability. And it's that reaching to your full potential that it just fills me with life. I, now, not always, right? Like I'm, I'm a human like anyone else that there's a lot of days where it's, it, especially when I was competing professionally, there's a lot of days it sucked. I didn't want to be out there. I was doing it because I knew I needed to and I didn't really want to. And it, it just isn't as life-giving in those moments. And, and I think the hardest part, especially when you get to a high enough level in any endeavor, is that the signs of progress, the fruit of progress are so slim. You put in all this work, but you don't see any tangible signs of improvement a lot of times. You can spend hours and hours and see no visible metric that you're actually making progress. Um, and that that's where you really have to have the the determination and persistence and the patience to endure, even if you aren't feeling that momentary inspiration. Mm. So in, in while growing up and you're thinking, I'm really good at golf. I love practicing golf. I love playing with my dad. I, I can get good at this. Maybe I can make it to the tour. And in the background, your dad's going, you can make the tour. You can make the tour. <laughs> He's telling you that you're good and you should keep going. And present. Was there a plan B? That's a great question. And, and you know, in the book, in that book you have there, I actually wrote about this because um, as someone who doesn't want to be let down, who doesn't want to end up as a failure, um, I always had in the back of my mind plan B, right? Or, or as I called it, plan A.5. So, you know, <laughs> contingency planning. And, and oftentimes we feel like that's smart. You know, we think that's wise, but it actually limits us by giving ourselves a way out. And it does like like there's this thing called Kokoro Camp. Um, it's in Southern California, and it's basically Navy SEAL Hell Week for civilians. You pay about twenty five hundred bucks, and for a weekend they push you past what you think your limits are, almost kill you in a lot of ways. Now it sounds horrible, but but the point sounds is <laughs> the point is that we have we have a level that we often aren't able to push ourselves to. We aren't able to force ourselves to that level often. We need someone else to. And so um, for me, by having a plan 8.5 of like, well, if this doesn't work, I could do this. It's limiting my ability to push myself up to where that potential is. Um, and I had to learn that. My college coach told me all the time, if you're going to be successful, you talk to anyone on tour, none of them had a plan B. It was like, what are you going to do if this doesn't work out? There's no option. It's working out like it has to, you know, and that's what often drives us to that level of performance and success. And early on in professional golf, I didn't have it because I wasn't fully believing that I could. And so because of that, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to do this and I have a three year plan. But if it doesn't, then I, you know, I have accounting finance degree I can go into business, that kind of stuff. 
So um, for a long time, I had a plan A.5 or plan B. Um, and it wasn't until about halfway through my professional career that I finally said, no, this is it. This is what I'm doing. Um, and that really helped. The, the, the golf. This mm-hmm. is uh, you're two years now into your professional touring. Yeah. And you're like, this is it. This is my life. Yeah. I have to fully commit. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that really did unlock um, a new level of commitment and also um, progress, especially mentally. I finally had some experience of what it was like around other professionals, going through the motion, arranging the schedule, setting myself up for success, knowing myself, knowing my game, trusting my game, the process, um, to where I, I was able to build on that foundation. But unfortunately, that's when the injury started and, and that derailed a lot of things uh, for my, my plans. And that's life. <laughs> yes, it is. And that's why... Um it's got to be hard to think about being a professional athlete because something could just out of nowhere, come up out of nowhere and change all your, your thoughts and probably mess with your head big time. Big time. Yeah, it really does. It's, you know, the body is a really amazing thing. And and part of the thing for me was it, there's a lot of things that we just aren't aware of within our body, but once you become aware of them, it's hard. You can't become unaware of them. And for me, once I realized from the injury, I got way more aware of my body as I was trying to problem solve and, and figure it out and, and work through the issues. Um, I became a lot more aware and I started realizing, oh, swinging a club one direction unilaterally for my whole life. There's a lot of discrepancies that I'm starting to notice, you know, and, and this, this sport that's low impact actually is got a good impact that you make hundred times every day, you know, and like, so you just start realizing how much of a toll the game does take on your body that a lot of times growing up, we're just naive or ignorant to. Yep. We're talking to Fane Marcus Ringler, and he wrote a book called From Here to There, A Quarter Life Perspective on the Path to Mastery. Um, And he's got some online courses that we're going to discuss. But first, we're going to take a quick time out. I'm curious what it's like once you start playing professionally and you've had, you know, and you're traveling and you're playing golf and you've got these guys that you played with in college and growing up in junior tours and stuff. And then it's taken away from you. Um, What's it like now for you to be watching your friends play on the PGA tour and seeing them and thinking, I can make it back. I'm done. I, I mean, where are you? Where is your head, your mindset now as far as seeing what could have happened if mm. you just didn't have um, this injury? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you inter- with that? it's interesting. It's a good question. You know, the, um, when I, when I came out of golf, uh, I really sat with the question, who have been, who have I been created, equipped and called to be? And as I sat with that question, I really felt that I could be more effective outside the world of golf than within it um, with Mm. how I've been wired, how I've been created, what my experience have given me and what I feel passionate or called to. I love the game of golf. I'm not a golf nerd. I'm not a golf fanatic. I love competing, you know. And so why I loved golf so much was as an outlet for competing. Um, And I love golf to this day and I will my entire life. But I think I realized that that drive uh, for my best and and what I could bring to the world, I wanted to unlock that in others. And that was a big calling or passion of mine. Um, And so that's really why I pivoted um, and why I transitioned out of it. And along with the body not working out as well either, that was obviously the the impetus for it. Um, And as I, as I watch now, the competitor never dies. And so, yes, I've been, you know, I took about, uh, uh, six months off, the body got to where I can play pain-free golf again. And that was such a blessing. I was so grateful. Um, and now, you know, I, I'll play father-son golf tournaments with my dad and um, play with some friends and stuff like that. But this summer, I actually competed for the first time again, individually and professionally, and just some local stuff here in Colorado. I did a qualifier for the Colorado State Open, did not get through. And then I played a um, state open up in Montana where my in-laws uh, are at called the Gallatin Valley Open and and was able to, it was a small field and got, I think, tied for four. So it was fun to earn a little money and get the co- competitive juices going again. And I'll say watching those guys, Michael and Harry and, and just some of the other guys uh, that I even competed against out there, it always makes me want to be there. 
It always does. But in remembering what that life is like and the unseen elements of it, it also, I, I remind myself that it's not all glamorous, it's not all sexy, and it's a pretty brutal lifestyle. I, I, on the PJ Tour, I don't have that experience, so I don't know what it's like. I know that it's still a lot harder than people imagine the lifestyle would be. But getting there, I, I know that that lifestyle, and it's and it's not what you would think. It's not a necessarily a, a fun journey. There's a lot of unsexy things about it, and it's pretty brutal when every week two thirds of the field is going home without a paycheck um, and not playing the weekend. And that's quite a lot of players every single week. How long did it take you after you were, you came to this realization that I I'm in too much pain. My body's not working. I can't play professionally anymore. How long did it take you to get into a mindset of being okay with that? You know, I think early on, I just poured myself so much into the entrepreneurial journey and trying to make what I was trying to create successful that I didn't really think about it too much. Uh, so I'd really? say this last year. Um, but you're still competitive. I know. I would think that, you know, it's like, I got to get back out there. I know. <laughs> well, it's funny because like I just flipped the switch in my mind of like, okay, this path is not it. I need to pour myself into this path and make this path successful. And it took so much energy and effort that I was just fully focused on that. But in the last year, as I've watched more golf again, I've returned to enjoying the game more and practicing a little bit and competing a little bit. It's definitely been more of a thought even this last year. Uh, and so I, I think reminding myself of not just the the flowery, cool, fun moments of it, but also the hard moments helped me have a realistic view of it. And then I just sit with, do I really feel like that's what I'm called to do? And I don't. Uh, I still don't. And if I did, that'd be cool. But I just don't. And so I have to be okay with um, that not being my realm anymore. That not being my my um, part of my identity in that sense. Uh, and um, and it's hard. It is right because the competitor never dies. And um, and I know, like still to this day, that the talent that I have is good enough. But there's a lot of people with good enough talent, right? You, you, it's not that's only half, if not less than half, of the equation. Um, and so, I, it's a Are humbling you a reminder. Are you a, I, somebody went who was who was on the tour and said you got to be a grinder? And I just couldn't get there. Yeah, I'm 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 okay at grinding, but I mean I, I hit the ball a long ways. I've got good ball striking, so um, it's just the again, like I get in my own way. It's the mental side that that limits me and. Um, and, uh, being a very, um, aware person and intentional person, it, it, I can get trapped in the thoughts. Um, so it's a, it's a fun personal challenge whenever I get to go out now. And it's such a great sport to learn about yourself and learn about life around us that, I mean, even competing in that tournament, you know, it's my wife who's, um, newer to the game and she got to be out there with her parents she's like you know you just sweat the little things too much i'm like you know what she doesn't even know golf that well but she is nailing it <laughs> i need so i, I need to like <laughs> just let shots go you know and and yeah 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 um it seems as if and you know we don't know each other and i'm just listening to what you have to say but it seems like your faith is really helping you and has helped you get through this to be on the other side and be okay with it 100 percent, it has and you know i really whether you are a person of faith or not i really love what god in the bible talks about um as humans and this is one of the things that i, I think is really helpful uh for all of us in in seeing each other as humans and and the way that god describes in the bible is that all humans are creating his image so everyone has worth and value no matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like, you have divine worth and value because you're a human being. And second, that we're all sinners, meaning everyone falls short. We all mess up. We all aren't perfect. Um, we all have mistakes. And because of those two things, we can see each other on the same playing field. Now, it's a very hard thing to do, right, to see each every single human as the same or equal. Um, but but pride makes us above the others and um, deprecation makes us below others. And, and I think if we can all strive to this identity as human beings that where we can see each other on the same playing field, regardless of if you're on the PGA tour or you're just at the local, you know, country club and you're playing with your friends, like 
you're still the same level as an identity as a human being. And I think that's one of the most helpful, especially in the time we find ourselves in. Unity is not necessarily a, a popular thing right now. And so I, I really I think that something like um, faith or belief in something beyond ourselves is really helpful in just being a grounded and humble human being. It unlocks a lot of that. Mm, very powerful. Very strong. Earlier you said um, that that life, and you threw up the air quotes and you talked about that life, about being on the tour. What is that life? How do, what, what does that mean to you? Well, most people probably don't know that for the average guy on the PGA Tour, it's taken them seven to 10 years to get there. Um, the exceptions, the outliers are the guys like Victor Hovland, Matt Wolf, Jordan Spieth, those guys that have great success as an amateur and in college, and then they get a break on the tour and they capitalize. That's one out of a hundred that are on, that get to the PJ tour. And so that's the 1% of the 1%. Now the 90% plus of the rest of the 1%, that are on the PJ Tour, have played on the PJ Tour, it takes them a long time to get there. My buddies I grew up playing Kansas, they were on different mini tours, just like me, um, working their way up through the system for three to five years before they finally got their card. Uh, and now that life is a lot of travel, a lot of expenses, a lot of failure, a lot of grinding in not so great places. You aren't playing great courses. You aren't in big cities. You don't have big crowds out there. Um, and a lot of times, not always the best characters either that <laughs> are out there. And so, uh, you know, it's... What does that mean? Meaning it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of... There's, at times on mini tours, there's a lot of guys who have um, just been playing mini tours, um, you know, for 20, 30 years because they love the game. And and sometimes they're just not guys for me that I would I would necessarily want to be around or play golf with. with um, yeah. yeah. So um, it's a mixed bag always, and that's it doesn't true. matter what where you're at. Every course has that too. So I think that's universal. Um, so all that to say is um, it's a very hard road, um, and the margin for success and failure is so small. I remember hearing a story when I was out there. There's a guy. Uh, for a corn ferry it used to be web.com right. and he um, Monday qualified in he got in in a playoff and then in the tournament he on the second round chipped in for eagle on the 18th hole mm -hmm. and by doing that he made the cut on the number and then in the weekend he played well finished in the top 20 I think which got him a spot in the next week's event and then the next week's event he won it which gave him full status so if he doesn't chip in for Eagle on the 18th, none of that happens. And it could have hit a rock. It could have hit a divot. The wind could have gusted up. Anything could have happened. Um, and it, I think that just shows you the, the almost the net level of neurosis that goes into success or failure um, yeah. in, those, in, that, in that world. And you got to just have, be able to brush it off. Exactly. And yep. that's not an easy thing to do. It's not when you're competing at that level. And when, and you know, the funny thing is it's weighted opposite. So on mini tours or developmental tours, when you're working way up, you pay a lot for a little on the top level, you pay a little for a lot. So meaning entry fees, yeah, I don't know what that means. Entry fees for tournaments on mini tours are typically anywhere from a thousand to 1500 bucks for full four, three or four day tournaments. And the mm -hmm. purse size for that is usually between 50 and a hundred grand. So that's total per size. So if you win it, you get maybe 20, 30 K, which is nice, but everyone else gets, you know, five, six K or less. And if you make the cut and you finish last of the people, you lose money. Um, now the higher up you get in the golf world, the, the less the entry fees are and the more you can get in return because they have way more sponsors, way more exposure, way more money coming in. Right. So in the lower levels, you're self funding the purse size basically. And uh, on the upper levels, there's a lot more to be had with less given um, in concept. So it, it's really interesting that, you know, on mini tours, when you're when you're paying like 12, 1300 bucks to play and you have a bad round, well, there goes down the drain, you know, because you're missing the cut. And, and you know, the guys on the mini tours can go just as low as anyone else. So you you there's no there's no skimping by out there. There's good players on every single tier of tour. 
And when you get to the upper level, I mean, there's probably sponsors picking up your entry fees. And but the thing that always blew my mind and, and continues to blow my mind about go professional golf is that they um, there's no team owner. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the golfer has to pay for everything, and that does and that doesn't just mean his entry fee and his caddy's tip or if caddy's fee, but that's the travel, that's the hotel, that's all the coaches that are traveling a lot. I mean, you have a tremendous amount of expenses, not saying that winning isn't great and you're going to get a lot of money, but you have to cover all that. There's nobody else funding that. Yeah. It, it gets really expensive really fast. And yeah. especially when you're on the lower levels, you're doing everything you can to save a dollar. You know, I mean, I was staying in these cheap little Airbnb rooms in someone's house on most of them, you know, and and you just try to pair your schedule to where you can drive everywhere to save money on travel. And usually you're not paying for a caddy unless you have a friend there that can caddy for you. Just, I mean, you're, you're really on a budget, um, which again, you have to then justify what is worth spending money on what's not. And that's always a tough decision too. Is it, is it worth spending more money on a coach um, than not? And will that pay dividends on the other end, you know, or, or on fitness or on this or so, there's a lot of factors um, and decisions. And the beauty of that on the flip side is that on other sports like football or basketball or baseball, it's such a corporate and almost political side of things where if you don't get drafted in the first couple of rounds, I heard from some baseball buddies of mine, like if you don't get drafted in the first couple of rounds, the owner hasn't placed their stake on you, right? If you're an owner and you draft someone, you're investing in making that person successful because you picked them. But for the guy in the seventh round, I'm not going to invest in that guy because if he makes it great for him, but I'm not investing in him, I'm investing in that first or second rounder. And so they're, they're, they're incentivized to make their choice successful. But if you're a guy trying to work your way up from the seventh round, you've got even more of the deck stacked against you. Whereas in golf, it's almost a wide open platform that if you have, if you can fund it, you can, you can do it. Amazing. Hey, we're going to take one more time out and we'll be right back. Thank you for subscribing to the Golf Smarter Podcast. With 760 episodes in our library, we've provided golfers of all skill levels around the world with instruction that, according to your reviews and emails, have had a significant impact on your enjoyment of the game. Since the podcast app that you're listening to right now doesn't carry more than 250 to 300 episodes of any podcast, there are 400, there are more than 400 episodes in our library that are just as helpful, but no longer available. That's why we've introduced Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on Golf Smarter. This week's episode couldn't be more relevant since Bryson DeChambeau has become the hottest topic in golf since winning the U.S. Open. Beyond his power, he's the only player on tour that plays with single-length irons. Well, in this conversation with the CEO of One Iron Golf from back in 2009, we learn all about single-length irons and why they could be right for you. Here's the interesting point. You can MOI match a set of golf clubs so they all feel the same at the beginning of your swing. Or... You can swing weight all your golf clubs, so they all basically have the same swing weight. In a conventional set of clubs, you can't do both. I mean, they're mutually exclusive. You can MOI match them, or you can swing weight match them. You can't do both. Here's the interesting thing. In a single-length set of irons like ours, swing weight is automatically matched. Mm. And the moment of inertia is automatically matched. They're the only clubs made that are both swing weight and MOI matched because the fact that our irons, single length set, these are identical clubs. If you're swinging our three iron, you're swinging our lob wedge, you'd never notice a difference. These clubs are identical, so they can be both MOI and swing weight matched at the same time. That's episode 76 of Golf Smarter Mulligans featuring the founder of OneIronGolf.com, David Lake, being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are free and available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe, and when you do, you'll receive brand new episodes of each automatically when they become available. When you were 
trying to get yourself uh, past the lower level tour, trying to get up there, um, and you have to pay all your expenses and stuff. How do you deal with caddies? Did you have friends caddy for you? Uh, and how did you convince them? It's like, well, there may not be any money in this, but it sure will be fun. How do you convince somebody to caddy? Totally. Well, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I had some friends caddy when they were in the same area and wanted to. Um, but again, if the friend isn't that good at golf, that's actually more of a hindrance than a help. And yeah, anytime, you're, now yeah. you're just dragging them along. It's like, yeah, just and, be quiet and hand me a club. Yes. And anytime, you know, that you have um, a caddy, the best caddies know your game the best, right? And they're able to operate almost as a an extension of you, like an arm of you. Um, so for me, that's my dad. My dad's a great caddy. And, and when we would go to tournaments and he was able to make it, he would caddy for me. And obviously he didn't want to get paid for it. So that's always nice, you know, but, yeah, right. but beyond that, I just kind of shied away from caddies ultimately, because one, I felt, especially on the mini tours, a lot of them, you don't have, you're not required to have one. Um, once you get to the corn farrier up, you are. Uh, and so a lot of those guys will start having more of a full-time caddy with them. Uh, which does help a lot when you can afford that or when it's required. And so when I played on over in Asia, um, you had to have a caddy over there too. And since it was such a long ways, I would just hire local caddies, which was hilarious. I mean, I, I was in South Korea for three tournaments and I had uh, on one of them like a middle-aged Korean woman um, <laughs> it was like my mom almost, you know, and she didn't speak hardly any English. It was just comical. You know, there, I remember I played, pretty bad the second day and I was really frustrated because I was going to miss the cut again and I remember getting to like the 17th hole and I'm like uh I think it's a driver today because I hit three wood before she's like no three wood I'm like no I think it's a driver no no three wood you know like handing it to me like saying you need to hit this I'm like give me the driver because <laughs> I was so mad um but it was just it was just I, you know and and, Fiji, and? I had a good shot, but I was already out of it at that point, so oh, it, it didn't wait, matter. Wait, did you hit the driver of the three wood? Yeah, I hit the driver. Yeah, I went. I yeah, you like, hit it all right. It. Yeah, I hit it good. Okay, okay. Uh, I, but I played. I played golf in Thailand once, and we had local caddies, and it's all women caddies over in Asia like that. And they just all they would say is, "Ooh, nice shot, nice shot." Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, "Thank you." Okay. Oh, yeah. it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's a mixed bag, but definitely when I could have my dad caddy, like in the Australian Open, they came over and he caddied for me, and that was such a memorable experience. Sure. Um, it does elevate the game, but a lot of times you're trying to save a buck, and yeah. that usually means you're, you're, you know, you use a push cart and you figure it out on your own. Yep, yep. All right, let's talk, let's talk about these online courses that you're doing that uh, in conjunction with your book from here to there, uh, it, and the book is available on Amazon? Correct. Excellent. All right. So is, are your online courses, uh, are they based on the, the books, on the, your writings in the book? So the courses come from the development coaching practice I've run for the last three years. And really what that is, is personal and professional development, uh, helping people usually in three categories if they're stuck, getting unstuck. Second would be leveling up in their current work or their role. Or third would be in a transition, pivoting to a new path or wanting to build a side hustle on the side. And really what the, that practice is, just taking the the habits and mindset of a professional athlete to everyday people in, in their lives. Um, what I did for myself as a golfer um, and applying that to others in their work. Uh, and so from that practice in the last several years and, and even working on speaking more, I, I've really come away with this kind of rally cry that I'm, I'm super passionate about. And I think um, individuals would all benefit from from kind of joining into this mantra rally cry. And it's a rally cry of one taking ownership, taking ownership of our thoughts, actions, behaviors, and not passing the buck, not passing the blame on anyone else, taking full responsibility. And, and golf teaches you that 100%, right? There's no one to blame. There's no referees. There's no teammates. There's nothing. You have to take full ownership. And how much better would this world be if we were all better at doing that? And that always starts on the individual level. Uh, and the second part of that rally cry is never settling. Never settling for less than you're capable of. The path of least resistance, the path downstream is always settling. That's our default. We all default to settling. Um, we're, we're lazy inherently, right? So we have to have effort and intention to not settle, to, to not settle for less than we're capable of. And that's a daily thing. And what those two rally cries entail 
taking ownership entails self-awareness. We have to be aware of what we are not taking ownership for or what we need to take ownership for in order to do that. We have to recognize it. And and I think self-awareness is something that we all can grow in. Uh, And the second one, never settling, the only way we never settle is by having discipline and developing discipline in our lives. Uh, And so these online courses are our um, outlets for that. The, the first one is taking ownership. It's about growing in awareness and self-awareness. How do we do that? How do we go on that journey? What is the process like? What are the tools that helps us? Uh, and the second one is about developing discipline, never settling, de- developing discipline within our, within our being um, and taking people through the process of that as well. So you, the, the two online courses that you're, you're doing, uh, developing discipline, and growing self-awareness. Um, what what's in it for the amateur golfer? Why yeah. should they Why should they be taking advantage of these courses with you? Yeah, that's a great question. So, as we know, in life and golf, they're parallels, right? And, and in golf, if we can't take ownership, right, and we can't be aware of why we're we keep hitting the shot in the water on the water hole, right? <laughs> that's a great example of like okay, there's a par three, there's over water. And seven out of 10 times I've been in it this past two months. And I'm going to keep doing it unless I take ownership or unless I recognize or I'm aware of why I'm producing that shot. And if I'm not in the water, then I'm in the bunker on the other side because I overcorrect. And how do we grow an awareness of what's affecting us? And so I think it applies directly to golfers as well in the sense that by growing in self-awareness and by growing in discipline, you will inevitably transfer those skills onto the golf course, not just in life. And, and honestly, I think, I think golfers are uniquely situated well for these in the sense that golf is a great arena to practice and develop these skills in and these characteristics in because there's less at stake than in life. There's less um, real world ramifications in a sense, you know, like if, if you're at your job and you don't, you settle for less than you're capable of. Well, there's a boss usually to reprimand you for that. On the golf course, there's not. So it's a great, almost pain free way to develop these things. Um, and I think that I, I always love trying to grow my personal um, characteristics on the golf course because you get immediate feedback. <laughs> right? When you, you go from thought to swing to result. And you get to test it every single shot. Um, and so it's a great realm to really understand and grow in these areas as well. Fabulous. So what is um, the uh, the online course? How long is it? Do you just download a PDF or is there a process that it go you go through in this course? Tell me more about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So they're both eight-week courses. Uh, they're designed for two months. Uh, and I really think that's a good amount and length of time for someone to really commit to something and then also have the enough patience and persistence to really grow in it. Um, and, and what they are is it's going to take people through eight weeks and, and there's going to be an introduction as well. And then usually a conclusion. So there's 10 capsules or sections within that. Um, and what's going to hold is a, a lesson where you get to kind of learn the, the information or the frameworks used and process the information. It's going to move into a quiz where you just regurgitate some of that so you can remember it better. Uh, and then it goes into journaling and additional exercises that will help practice and instill that in our lives. Um, so it's pretty simplified. It's a simplified framework, um, but it's available on my website. So it'll be uh, at thanemarks.com and it'll be um, at courses.thanemarks.com when that when that goes live. Um, and really... It's all online. It's all um, through the the website and it'll be a pretty seamless process for people and hopefully enjoyable, um, but also challenging in that we're we're reaching to grasp at our our potential that's beyond us and a lot of times untapped. Mm -hmm. And are these self-directed? I'm like, if I were to do the course, am I all on my own the whole time uh, or am I working one on one with you? How does that work and why eight weeks? Yeah, so there's a couple ways to do it. There's a, there's an option just to go all self-directed. Um, there will be a community, so you can interact with other students or people that are going through the courses. Um, and then there's also an option to um, 
uh, level up with some one-on-one coaching as well. So there's a package where you can purchase individual one-on-one coaching alongside the course to help um, provide more feedback and more accountability with that. Um, the Y eight weeks is again when I when I work with individuals um, coaching wise, I've found two months to be really uh, a great amount of time to get to the the level that you need to of depth of what the root causes are and start unpacking why some of those symptoms are affecting you in your life. And within these concepts, we always have to start and why it takes eight weeks a lot of times is one, there's there's certain elements of the process to unpack that does take more time. But more importantly, we always need to start with a belief, a belief in the why behind what we're doing. Because if you don't believe that discipline is important, there's no reason to commit two months of time to following through with this. We all have a lot on our plate. We all have things vying for our attention and time. And so by starting with things like belief and motivation and understanding what those are for us and why these things matter, that will hopefully give us the endurance to go through two months. Uh, And really, I don't want to, my goal and heart in this isn't to overload people with way too much time or information or uh, things to do. I want to give them the MVP, the minimum viable product that Mm -hmm. will produce the most efficient and effective results for them in their life. Interesting. So you, you do an hour a day, you do two hours twice a week. Um, it, it's completely up to you or do you have like guidelines of here's what I want you to spend on this today. And here's how do you So do it's, that? it's per week. Um, it's based uh-huh. on your, it's pretty flexible. Um, uh-huh. Each capsule or each section will probably take, um, I haven't timed it myself, but with doing the journaling and the exercises, I'm guessing it'll take anywhere from two to four hours a week. So not a okay. huge commitment. Um, the okay. lessons themselves are all going to be between 10 to 15 minutes. So they're pretty short. Um, it's the journaling, the exercises, and the additional things that you can do after that to instill it and actually bring it into real life. That are the things that take time. And each week has different lengths of of time that are required with those exercises, but I'd say a good average would be in between two to four hours and that's self-directed. And so technically if someone wanted to do this course in two weeks, they, they could go through because a lot of the content is released based on completion. Oh, okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take eight weeks. It could be quicker depending on what you commit to. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's self-directed in that. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. All right. And there's two courses. Um, are they available now? They are available for pre-order. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. So, okay. um, they so are we're th- right now, we're, we're at the end of September of 2020. Um, and you're, uh, the, and the website is thanemarcus.com, which is T-H-A-N-E-M-A-R-C-U-S, thanemarcus.com. Um, pre-order. So what does that mean? What that means is I'm in the middle of finishing the second one right now. (laughs) And so because of that, uh, they aren't fully live yet, Um, but they will be by mid to late October. Um, And so that's a place for people to go. And and I love uh, pre-orders are honestly a great thing because a lot of times when we hear a conversation or we hear something and, and in our heart or in our gut, we know like, man, that'd be good for me to do unless we take action in that moment or in the near future, we probably won't follow through with it, right? We'll, we'll settle for less than we know we need in that. And trusting that gut instinct and following through with something that we know we need to do is important. And so by committing to something through a pre-order is a great way for people to say, hey, this is something I, I, I really believe I need and I, I want to commit to, and I'm going to sacrifice some dollars to do that and hold myself accountable to it. How much is it per course? So they're going to be $150 per course, but uh, when they launch, they'll be uh, $100 um, on the pre-order. They'll be $100, and when they for a limited time when they first release, $100 each. Um, And uh, I'd love to give people that are listening to this because I think you've got a great podcast. I'd love to give them um, a discount on that pre-order option as well. Oh, and what is that? Thank you. What what is the... 20% 20% off the pre-order price, so it'd be $80 for... Oh, wow. So it's normally $150, pre orders 100 but Golf Smarter listeners get an additional 20% off, so it's only $80? Correct. That's a heck of a deal. How do we take advantage of that? 
Go into ThaneMarcus.com and there'll be near the top, there'll be a courses section. Uh, you click on that and there is where you'll insert in, um, you'll you'll purchase the, the course, the pre-order, and you can insert the code GOLFSMARTER, all one word, all lowercase, uh, and that'll unlock the 20%. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Thane. That's very generous of you. And I wish you all the luck with that. I hope it goes well uh, because you're not going to be making a whole lot of money playing golf anymore, huh? <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> just, just the weekend money match. That's all. There you go. Take your dad with you. Yeah. Great talking to you, man. Thanks so much for, for the book and for your efforts. Um, and I, I think that you're going to have people taking advantage of it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Fred. This has been a lot of fun and just grateful for the time together. Hey, how you'd like a new High Heat 257 Plus fairway metal that was designed to help the average golfer get the ball in the air easier, go further, and have it built to your specs. This is your chance to win the new High Heat 257 Plus fairway medal from Knuth Golf. Registration is open right now at GolfSmarter.com. Just click on the Enter Now banner at the top of the page. Deadline to enter is Sunday, October 4, 2020, midnight Pacific Time, 3 a.m. Eastern. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for products or guests, just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.